God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So glad to be with you. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Thanks for the invite. For the Suber, for the Morgan. Wow. As Brother Tenney used to say, holy wow. Wow. Awesome. You got a tremendous impact from what you said. And a great confirmation of what I tried to say a lot about last night. Amen. If you have your Bibles, it would be so kind. Uh, I'm not going to be, thank you, Jesus, as long-winded as I was last night. I'm in between you and groceries. Dangerous position. But I want to, uh, I feel like there was a left, enough left unsaid last night. that I want to just kind of just throw a few little morsels your way and, and finish this episode. Genesis chapter 15. Brother... Uh, Charles Shearer, I need you to get back into Genesis 1 and verse 6. We never got there last night. Just a few little things, okay? You've heard enough preaching. If you ain't saved by now, you probably won't be. I mean, how much is enough? You know, we're developing a generation of Pentecostals just... Picking out, you know. Woo, woo, give me another thing. Why you ain't used the last one you got? Woo, 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 woo. Genesis 15, verse 7, and he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of the earth, Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit. He said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? He said, Take me a heifer three years old, she goat three years old, ram three years old, turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He took unto him these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another but the birds divided he not when the fowls came down upon the carcasses Abram drove them away the sun was going down a deep sleep fell upon Abram and lo a horror of great darkness fell upon him and he said unto Abram know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them they shall afflict them 400 years also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge and afterward shall they come out with great substance thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace thou shalt be buried in a good old age but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. okay pretty well understand where I want to go just for a few minutes. I know it's an unusual thing to kind of preach or teach or speak about part two, but it's just a lot of things I, I feel like I just need to say. Okay, I'll try to be in and out of the shoot in 30 minutes, and if that happens, signs and wonders and miracles are still available. <laughs> Lord, bless the preaching and the teaching. Help me to do a good job in a little bit of time. Help me not to be long-winded, but be effective in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Thank you. God bless you, and you may be seated. Praise God. Praise God. When the Lord began to deal with Abram in this episode in chapter 15, if you can accept this, and it goes right along with what you were saying, this prophecy, for the Lord was giving Abram a prophecy. It was as if God stepped on the stage of time and the unborn ages were summoned from the womb of time. To parade across the mind of a dreaming man and the Lord spoke of a future to a man in the present about stuff he didn't understand and God began to deal with him and in these few verses of Scripture in Genesis 15 there were time and territory involved verses 13 and 14 there was God's now this is the way you teach There was God's permissive will that was involved. There is a permissive will. If you don't believe it, you don't read the Bible. Because in verses 13 and 14, he said, I'm going to allow your seed to get messed over. Hell can't do nothing to him unless I allow it. Don't you ever believe hell's in charge of nothing. Those idiots don't even have the keys to their own house. 
Don't you ever believe nothing hell tells you. Hell's a liar. Hell's a liar. Yeah. And in verse 13 and 14, God just demonstrates through a declaration his permissive will. For he's going to allow this man's seed to be affected and afflicted and suffer adversity and persecution and suffering and pain and sorrow. And he says, but don't worry about it. I got my hand on the thermostat and when it's ready, I'll bring them out. And in verse uh, 15, you see the declaration of God's personal will regarding Abram. He said, but you'll die in a good old age. And uh, God is so powerful. He says, I I'll tell you when you die. Oh, you didn't hear me. I'd like to rant and rave, but I don't think you're in a rant and raving mood. Uh, uh, God is so powerful that death can't do nothing until he says, okay. I'll tell you, God is so powerful that even when in his humiliation, when he walked in the body of the man Jesus of Nazareth, that was his humiliation. He's now in his glorification, but he was in his humiliation. He was so powerful then that it hung naked on a cross. So powerful then, bleeding and bruised, that death couldn't take him till he said, okay. So awesome, he's preaching from a cross. He's telling stuff, you can't have me till I say so. Until I say it's finished and I give up the ghost, you can't take me. Because I'm so powerful. You don't ever want to get in a place where God opens his mouth. Because if God opens his mouth, you don't want to let him go in a graveyard because he'll have a resurrection. You don't want to let God get around disease because he'll heal everything in the house. If, if you can just get a word from the Lord, it's all you really need. Oh yeah, you, you, see we, we got this hang up. Brother Subo is right. We, we got to have always the presence of God. What's wrong with the promise of God? I thought the promise of God is equal to the presence of God. I thought in John chapter 4 when the nobleman come down and said, Heal my son. Come on down and heal him. Ere my boy died, he wanted Jesus to go. He said, My faith is attached to your presence. The Lord wouldn't go with him. He said, Come down here and my boy die. He said, No, I ain't going to go with you. Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. He said, Come down here and my boy die. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you something equal to my presence. Here's a promise. Thy son liveth. Now he left the presence and took the promise. And the promise worked. God is trying to tell this conference through these two preachers already that if you've got a promise, you've got his presence because his promise and his presence are equal. Because God can't lie. Oh, I don't know whether you're hearing me. Yeah, I don't... Listen, when the Bible says in Hebrews, it is impossible for God to lie, does anybody in the house know what that really means? It does not mean, I don't care what you Ohio theologians try to write it off, I got the mic and I know what it means. It does not mean God cannot tell a lie. That's not what it means. It means God is so powerful and so awesome that if he were to say something at the time that was not true, when it comes out of his mouth, it becomes true. If God says it, it is. When the scripture says we are more than conquerors, I don't care if you get your brains beat out or not. You are what God said you are. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave his life for us. You've got to start accepting that you are what God said you are. Are you hearing me? I'm, I'm going to mess with you for just a minute. I know you got chicken on your mind, but just hold on just a second. If God ever opens his mouth and lets some verbiage come out, it becomes what he said. Even though all the circumstances and all the obvious signals says, taint so. The angel meets Gideon trying to get a little bowl of shredded wheat behind a wine press. So full of fear, he's hiding to get breakfast. And the angel greets him and says, hey, thou mighty man of valor. You got the wrong zip code, Dad. But you see, God does not take things as they are. 
He declares things that are not as though they shall be. He declares the future right now. You see, time, uh, time doesn't affect God. God made time. God works in time. God is pre-time. God will be post-time. And God is present time. Time is the creation of God. It doesn't have the power to affect God. When God says something, it is. Say, put your hand on your chest and say, I am right now what God said I am. He said, I'm the righteousness of God, even when I act unrighteous. Uh, you didn't hear me. You see, righteousness is a legal term. It's your judicial term. It's when the judge says, innocent, even if you were guilty. Once the gavel comes down, you are what the judge said you are. You're out of here, bud. You're not hearing me. Pentecostals have a hard time thinking that we want to just hit a hokey, run around and bang into the walls. I am the righteousness of God. Right now. When I have a bad day and have a bad thought and act like a fool and tell somebody off, have a bad attitude, you don't lose your righteousness. You may lose your peace and your tranquility and your serenity and your soul, but you don't lose your awe. Oh, you don't lose your standing. You're not stepping in and out of the righteousness of God every day because you make some wrong decisions and have a bad day. You are the righteousness of God. Well, I'm going to go a little further. I am holy even when I don't act like I'm holy and when I don't think like I'm holy and I don't feel like I'm holy. I am holy. Standards and dress codes don't make you holy. The Holy Ghost makes you holy. God's got to make the house holy. Then the house watches its activities. We don't live a certain way and dress a certain way, and refrain from certain things so we can be holy. We does that jazz because we be holy. I don't do this and do that and do this so I can be married to Patty. I is married to Patty. Now I do this, that, and the other. Because it's lonely on the couch. Hello. Can I talk a few minutes? I'm just going to talk. Just, I'm just going to talk. According to verse 16, we see the preordaining will of God. He tells them that he's going to bring them out. He's going to put them in trouble, but he's going to bring them out of trouble. You've got to hear what I'm trying to tell you from last night. You will not die in your dilemma. Your situation is not great enough to kill you. You are going to go through it. You are going to come out of it. If God gives you a promise, nothing can stop you from what God has prophesied to you is going to pass. It doesn't matter that you got problems. It doesn't matter that you got setbacks. It doesn't matter that you got adversity. If God said you're coming out, hell can't keep you in. If God said you're victorious, no defeat can stop you. God's word is so full of power. Just, just bear with me a minute. I, I won't be long. I won't be long. I'm, I'm going to make a statement now, Reverend. You're a man of faith and you preach a lot of faith. I want to make a statement that's going to ill affect the whole Pentecostal movement. It is right anyway. Contrary to modern theology and popular preaching at Pentecost, the will of God is not the determining factor of who you become and what you become and what you receive from God. Just, just let it slip. You just take your bishop, chew on it a while. I'll prove it to you. You say, well, if it's just the will of God. Well, I'm going to tell you what, the will of God isn't the determining factor. Because the Bible said it's not God's will that any perish or any perishing. It's not the will of God that determines it. It's your faith and obedience to his will. Jesus walked into Nazareth and wanted to heal everything in the joint. He couldn't do any mighty works there because what? Of his will? No. Because of his un their unbelief. He turned around and wept over Jerusalem and said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Watch. How oft I would have gathered.
to thy children. That was my will. I wanted to gather you and, and love you and embrace you and help you. But thou wouldest not. It ain't the will of God that determines that. It's your faith. Well, I'm starting to mess. I'm sorry, Reverend. You heard two good sermons. Two out of three, that's not bad. They pay professional players $100,000, $500,000, $2 million a year to strike out seven out of ten times. Well, that's the will of God. I'm going to handle this. How, how come you keep accepting all your sickness? Uh, it's the will of God. Really? Then how come you keep trying to get rid of it? Now, I'm going to treat you a little. If you believe it's the will of God for you to have cancer and tuberculosis and diabetes, why don't you ask God to give all your family this blessing so you can all join the will of God together? And if it's the will of God for you to have a tumor, why do you keep taking cobalt treatments and themo? Uh, that crazy stuff that they fry your liver with. Why do you keep taking that stuff? Why do you keep trying to get rid of the will of God? And if you believe your sickness even to the place of having a migraine headache is the will of God, why do you take aspirin? Why do you keep... Uh, why do you keep trying to get rid of the will of God? If you believe that sickness and disease is your Father's pleasure and will for you, why don't we burn down hospitals and arrest all the doctors and nurses? Because they're fighting the will of God for you. They're trying to get you better. Turn to someone, look at them and say, do we believe this? Isn't it funny? The only two people I could find in the Bible that were never sick was the first Adam and the second. never had a sniffle, didn't have the flu, didn't take flu shots, was never sick. Why? Because sickness comes out of sin. And before sin was in the earth, there was no sickness. You ever notice that nobody in heaven's got the sniffles? You ever notice that nobody in heaven's got pneumonia, tuberculosis, leukemia? Oh, have I stirred up a mess here. You believe it's the will of God for everybody to have the Holy Ghost? How come everybody doesn't have the Holy Ghost? If the will of God is the determining factor for everybody's life. See, it's a cop-out. It's a Pentecostal coward cop-out. Say, well, it just must be the will of God. Oh, give me a break. You can do a lot more for God healthy than you can sick. I'm going to go a little further. It ain't the will of God for the people of God to be in poverty either. We're not supposed to have a welfare mentality. Oh, no, we're not. Now, I'm not damning and condemning anybody that might be on food stamps, but you ought not desire to be on food stamps. You ought to desire to get off them. You ought to desire that the blessing of the Lord would overtake you and so that you can pay your own way. Read Luke 16, the tragedy of that story of Lazarus, the beggar sitting at the gate. Here's what it says. What a curse on his life. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs. It's one thing to have to eat crumbs. It's another thing to desire crumbs. We shouted so good last night. The Lord. Can I just, yeah, a few minutes. I just got a few minutes. The Lord tried to tell Abram that there's a lot of hell and chaos and crud coming your way, but I don't want you to be defeated by it. The problem is in the promise. And no matter what they do to your kids, don't worry about it. I got my hand on them. And God is so powerful that he is willing to speak to us about stuff we are not presently. God 
doesn't get afraid to declare your destiny while you're struggling in the mess. I have made thee a father of many nations. He has no kin. Because God knows that if it comes out of his mouth, it's got the power to make you to become what it promised. And time affects us, but it doesn't affect him. You ever notice how slow it seems God moves? He tells you something, and you wait, 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 and you wait. Then you start doubting and wondering, is the prophecy that I hear from my Looney Tunes, what's going on with me? And we get impatient, and God doesn't get impatient because time doesn't affect him. See, he stands at the end of the parade and calls back and says, this way, folks. And while you're waiting to get into the 1999, he's sitting there putting money in the meter. And by the time you get to where you're supposed to be, you're almost wore out. And he goes, okay, let's go to the next level. If you're not hearing me. When God called Gideon, thou mighty man of valor, he was calling him something that he wasn't now presently. But he would be in the will and the pleasure and the purpose and plan of God. And you got to determine who you're going to take your signals from, the promise or the problem. Am, am I making any sense yet? The Lord told Abraham, now I'm going to let you get in slavery and I'll put you in a mess, but don't worry about it. Kind of like when the Lord told about John the Baptist. None greater born. The cat's in jail. Place, nice place for greatness born greater than John. He's in jail. He thinks so much of John, never visited him once. That was his cousin. One visit from Jesus would have taken care of it all. John's suicidal. You see, there's a big difference in jumping up and down on the Jordan saying, behold the Lamb of God, and then how you sing the same song when you're behind bars. Are you him or do we look for another? Did, did I prophesy or did I not prophesy? Did you talk to me or did you not talk to me? You see, things look different when you're in adversity. Could, could I just get a, a, just a shake of the head? If you're not going to say amen, could you just kind of give me a Methodist nod here, a Baptist cough, <coughs> just anything. Makes me a little nervous. I'm not used to preaching in libraries. I'm trying to tell you how powerful God is. All you got to do is get a word from God and hold on to it. All you got to do is get a promise from God and hold on to it. I don't care what hell does. I don't care what life does. I don't care what your emotions do. I don't care what your relatives do. If God said it, it's settled, my friend. Nothing can make God change his mind about you. Don't you see that's what hell was trying to do to God in the story of Job? Hell was trying to get God to change his mind about Job and God wouldn't do it. Just a few minutes and I'm, I'm out of here. God's word is so powerful. If you can just get a promise, you just latch yourself onto it and you won't die in your, in your dilemma. I, I want to show you how powerful the word of God is. Would you read for me, Reverend? Genesis 1, 6, and 7. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. And God said, yeah, and God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Now, you get, you get what that means? Atmosphere. But I wonder if we've ever really understood the engineering. It was unbelievable, that feat of engineering. The place was covered with water. And God, see, you don't have to have nothing going for you for God to command a blessing. He can step into death and cause life. He can step into darkness and say, let there be light. He can walk into confusion and bring order. See, you don't have to get going to do anything. You just let God open his mouth and walk into your fiasco and see if he can't fix it. The whole earth, the Bible said, was covered with water. And what does God do? He comes in commanding. Let there be a pyramid in the midst of the waters. And let us separate the waters that are above the waters from those that are below the waters. Is that about what it says? Let us divide the waters from the waters. Go ahead. And God laid the garments and divided the waters which were under the garments from the waters were above the garments. Now you talk about Arnold Schwarzenegger being a weightlifter and a bodybuilder. You ain't never met nobody that's equal to this weightlifter. In one statement, 
God walked into a baptism of water. Water weighs 773 times more than air. Scientists tell us the water that is now held in vapor form between the atmosphere above the clouds weighs 540, 400, 540 trillion, 460 billion tons is hanging in the air. And all God had to do to lift that much water, he said, get up! You're not hearing me. God is so powerful, he can walk into your disaster and lift something off you so easy and bring you through something so quickly and deliver you from something that seems to be a disaster with just one word. Have you got anything you need for him to lift off you? Have you got anything for him to fix in your life? Have you got a burden that you need some help? If he can lift up that much water with one word and hold it in the air, it can't come down till he lets it. Are, are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? 54 trillion, 460 billion tons of water. Tons. 54 trillion, 460 billion tons. God walked into high tide and said, Separate, open that up! I wonder what the world thought about when they saw that water going up. And it just kind of... And it just like stands in the air going, Yes, sir. He said, Now you hang up there for a while. Because about Genesis 6, 7, and 8, I'm going to need you to drop again. And then the Lord opened up the bowels of the earth and water came up. And the Lord told the envelope above the earth, drop down. And that's why it came down. Listen, every element in the universe obeys God. Every situation is under His sovereign control. You've got to hear me. There's no devil in charge of your destiny. There's no disease in charge of your destiny. There's no problem in charge of your destiny. God is wanting you to exercise your faith and believe if He promised to bring you out. He's more than able to bring you out of your mess, out of your prison, out of your problem, out of your dilemma, out of your situation. Nothing can hold you if God says, come out. Oh my. Let me just run real quickly here and I'll finish. Abraham was told your seed's going to go into a sojourn. They're going to stay down there for a while and they're going to become slaves. They're going to be beaten, mistreated, helpless. But afterward, you've got to live with an afterward in your soul. This is not the end. There's going, oh, I wish I had time. Do you know that the next chapter in your life could change everything? Don't you understand that hell wants to hold you and I hostage to despair and helplessness and hopelessness as if what has been forecast and is now being worked out is the end of the story? Don't you understand that even Jesus had downtime? He was down three days and three nights, but he's been up a lot more than he's been down. Honey, you can get down, but you don't, oh yes, you don't have to stay down because you've got resurrection power in you. If you go down, you're going to bounce back up because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You're going to come out of there. Give me just a few minutes. Just give me a few minutes. I'm sorry, I'm trying to resurrect the dead here. He said, you're going to come see? I can't preach, I gotta teach, I gotta, there's a question mark on your face. You gotta understand something. God is after one thing from you, just one, ain't your money. He don't need any. Why would you need somebody's dime on a dollar if you can make gold? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all they that dwell therein, all the souls of the earth are mine. Haggai 2 and 8, all the gold and all the silver and all the hills is mine. 
Oh yeah, Psalms 50, read it, 10, 11, and 12. He says, all the creatures of the forest are mine, all the fowls of the air are mine, all the fish that swim the sea are mine. So all this stuff is his. What's your problem? David turned around in 1 Chronicles 29 and said, this great offering and this great sacrifice and this great abundance that we have come here to give to you, Lord, so that we can build the temple called Solomon's temple. He said, what is it first? But that thou gavest unto us first, and we have but returned unto you what you've given. That's why God hates it when people don't tithe and people don't give and they don't sacrifice because God gave to you first. It wasn't yours. God gave it to you. And he expects you to be a steward. He expects you to be honest. He expects you to be reciprocal. You're only returning to God his own stuff. The only reason God killed Achan and his family was because Jericho was the tithe of the promised land. It was the first fruits. And he stole his tithe. That's why Adam got in trouble in the Garden of Eden. He took God's first fruits. It was a tree. God has a right to set some things aside for himself. We always use a misnomer. I paid my tithes. You can't pay something that you don't own. Tithe ain't mine. Tithe's the Lord. I can't believe people that are so stingy and selfish and self-centered that they rape God from a dime on a dollar, but they trust the same preacher with their soul. My God, if God ain't good enough to trust on a dime on a dollar, don't trust the preacher with your soul. Boy, it got quiet. When I got saved, I made 77 bucks a week. I paid $8 a week tithes. Patty didn't even have no dresses. She had shorts and slacks. That's all she had. She bought two little shirt waist dresses. Wool coat used to sell them. Iron one and wear the other. Iron one and wear the other. Now, here I am 25 years later. I am so wealthy. I'm worth five billions. Five zillions. Pokalula lillions. I'm worth so much, I've never even got a, a raise in 16 years. You're not hearing me. I asked our church this year at the business meeting, I want two things. I want all you bums out there that borrowed money to pay me back. <laughs> two, I want to make this year what you all thought I made last year. And we'll both be happy. Oh, I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you. I'm so sorry. Don't you get it? God's after one thing and one thing only. Here's what he's after. He wants from you and I a testimony. The first four letters of testimony is test. Oh, I'd like to have a testimony. Will you qualify for a test? Because oh, you can't have a testimony if you don't go through a test. You can't have a triumph if you don't go through a trial. You can't be a witness until you withstood some stuff. God wants a testimony from us. But sometimes we're not willing to go through the test. But that's how you get a testimony. God brought me through. God brought me over. God brought me out. God's bringing me in. That's what it's about. And they all retain it by the word of their testimony. Don't you get it? God wants to turn your test and my test into a testimony. Our trial into a triumph. Come on, be honest. Just say, he does. I thought it's the devil doing all these. I thought it's my mother Lord doing all this. I thought it's my in-laws doing all this. I thought it's my high school doing all this. No, 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 no. You see, when God sent Abraham down, he said, I'm sending him to a place of trial. I'm sending you into a place of affliction and adversity. Why? Because when you come out, you will have a testimony. What will be the testimony? He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. See, God is jealous about who gets the credit. And he doesn't want you to get the credit. So he puts you in something that you can't get yourself out of. So that when he shows up and sets you free, you're going to have to say, It was the Lord who was on our side brought us out, who killed Pharaoh's army, who buried him in a Red Sea. I'm not going to pose for a picture. I'm not going to take credit. If it had not been for the Lord, we'd still be in sin.
slavery. You didn't save yourself, God saved you. You didn't deliver yourself, God delivered you. Can I have about five minutes? Five minutes and I'll quit, okay? You gotta hear me. See, if you don't believe this, you're gonna have frustrated faith. You can't quote, Jesus is Alpha, if you don't finish with, he's also Omega. No, 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 no. It's easy to say, God, me, God got me in. You better be able to say, being that he's Omega, he's fixing to get me out. God won't ever put you in something that's got the power to destroy you, to devastate you, to ruin your faith. He's going to put you in something because he plans on getting you out. But when you come out, you're going to be purified. When you come out, you're going to be more valuable. When you come out, you're going to have a testimony. When you come out, you're going to be more effective than you ever were. And you're going to look back like David and say, it was good for me that I have been afflicted. For my feet had gone astray. But now I've kept thy testimonies. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. You gotta believe there's gonna be a after. Right, you wanna write something? Write this down. You preach this. Okie pokey. Write this down. I'd like to preach a sermon on the awesome assumptions of Jesus. The centurion sends people to him and says, my servant is sick at home. And Jesus takes the position of total assumption. I'll come and heal him. Notice what he didn't do like us. Well, we'll come and pray. Uh, well, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Well, let's try to believe God. That never happened with Jesus. It was a foregone conclusion, honey. When him and disease butted heads, disease loses. He didn't say, I'll try to fix your servant. He said, I will come and heal it. Had nothing to do about the will of God. It had to do about the centurion's faith. And the leper meets him in Matthew 8, coming down off the mount. Lord, if you will, I know you can. He says, I will be thou clean. He rewarded his faith. Faith is what releases the energy of God into your life, into your situation, into your mind, into your spirit, into your body. That's why you've got to believe God. Let me, let me say this and try to stop. Expectation. I say it everywhere I go. Is the birthplace of the miraculous. And when you don't expect nothing, you get exactly what you're expecting. When you come to church and sit on your duff and just hope the choir will move you, the preacher will resurrect you, what an insult to the kingdom of God. Who are you that somebody's got to move you anyway? I thought we came together, Brother Showalter, to move God. I thought we came to tickle him. I thought we came to make him happy. I think if I get him moving, stuff will happen. It doesn't matter that I get moving. I need God moving. If God steps down into the situation, things change. I thought we're here to bring him pleasure. I thought Revelation 4 said all things were created by him and for his pleasure. It's real easy to know whether you're walking with God. Ask yourself one simple quiz question. Am I pleasing God? Because the Bible says Enoch pleased God and experienced the translation. I'm not doing so good here. Jarius comes looking for Jesus and said, my daughter's now dying, even at the point of death. Come and lay your hand on her, watch, and she shall live. I don't see nothing about the will of God. I don't see him saying, now Lord, if it's your will, come and heal my daughter. No, he, he just assumed God was good and God was life and God was wholeness and God was wellness. And he said, come and heal my daughter. Lay your hand on her and she shall live. We're not here for your interpretation, Jesus. I need your power. My faith is in your ability. Will you please use it? And Jesus went with him. Listen, usually when a miracle's heading your way, it gets worse. 
you believe God, you made contact with God, but before the thing can ever turn around, something dies. Because the child died. Oh, I wish I had time. Uh, you read that stuff, more message, it's a good message. The Bible says, before he got to Jairus' house, some of the servants come. There's always some nincompoop going to tell you the worst. And they run up to Jesus and Jairus and they say, My daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. Now listen, this is a revelation for me. I'm not smart. i got to get these things. Here's what happened. If you read that scripture, Mark 5, it says, Trouble not the master. Thy daughter is dead. The next verse says, And when Jesus heard the word, What word? For 20 years I used to think, She's dead. Or don't trouble. But the word is, Master. If you can say master, what's yours confessing is, this is too big for me, but it ain't too big for you. Ah, when he heard that word, what word? Master. He turned around and said, you're right. I'm the master of death. You just let me come to the house. I'm the master of disease. I'm the master of trouble. I'm the master of pressure. If you can learn to say master. You can look at a situation, Brother Perry, and say, this thing is too great for me. But I say you are the master. What you say when you say master, you're able if you want to. Master, carest thou not that we perish? Notice that they didn't say boss. Rabbi, pal, Messiah, Savior. No, you wake him up with the word. Hey. You're standing in the middle of howling winds and you're ready to go down to Davy Jones' locker and you've addressed your Lord as Master! You talk about flexing muscle. You talk about moving towards the head of the boat. Listen to me, he's so powerful, he stepped on the bow of that boat and said, Shut up! And everything in creation said, That's him! That's the voice! That's the boss! That's the master! Silly! Seas lay down! Wind stop blowing! Fear leave this boat! If you can learn to say, Master! Can I have another five minutes? Sit down here. Five minutes and we'll get all the chicken we can eat. And, and Lazarus is dead four days. And Jesus shows up for Martha and Mary, and they made the same mistake. Because Martha says to Mary, the master has come and call it for thee. You don't want to take the master to a tomb of a dead man, because the master is going to see who is the master. Whether death is the Lord, or he is the Lord. And with one statement, Lazarus, come forth. see who is the master now we'll see who is number one now we'll see whether God's got the power two, two minutes two minutes I'm sorry I just kind of switched gears here just a minute I was trying to teach and Luke 5 and then using I love oh I wish I had time I, I love the way Jesus if you read Luke 5 and read Mark scripture says that there was Simon Peter's boat. Now, now, if you read it, read it real careful, because I read it real careful. The problem with Jesus being the master is he invites himself. That's what I thought. If you read the story, the Bible said the boat was empty, and Jesus entering the ship. There's no record. He said, Pete, could I use your boat? 
could I use your facility? Now, see, when you're the master, you don't ask, Mother, may I? Simon says, when you're the master, being that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, Pete, you're just renting it. The boat's mine. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He steps into the boat. He teaches the people. When he finishes teaching the people, he says to the guy who thought he owned the boat, Watch. He don't suggest for the show, Walter. He does not suggest. He says, launch out in the deep. Let down your net for a trot. Man, you're giving orders around here. Like maybe you're in charge. He said, let down your net for a trot. And Simon Peter does what we does. Except he made one mistake. Master! We, 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 we toiled all night and ain't taking nothing. We're fishermen. You're a carpenter. You don't have no sea legs. You're a land lover. And Jesus looks at Pete and says, what, what did you call me? My, 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 my. Master. Okay, how many failures you've had? If you can get the master on your little boat, the next trip's going to be a harvest. And only the master, Brother Morgan, only the master would ever ask you to try to fish where you failed before. Only the master would ever ask you to try again where you failed. Oh. Only the master would say, get up, boy. My grace is sufficient for thee. I don't care that you've sinned. I don't care that you've failed. I don't care that you've made a mistake. I'm the master of disease. I'm the master of devils. I'm the master of sins. I'm the master of life. Stand up with me. I'm on. I didn't finish. I'm so sorry. I really didn't get started. <laughs> just leave you with this last thought when the Lord told Abram that his seed was going to be slaves in Egypt what he was actually saying was now their journey into Egypt is going to be hard it's going to be cruel it's going to be painful it's going to seem unending but just remember this Abe I've designed Egypt's trouble and pressure and pain and woe as an incubator for a nation Because I'm going to send them in as a tribe. And I'm going to send the tribe into trouble. And when the tribe gets through with its trouble, it's coming out three million strong as a nation of one God believers. See, what, what, what? I got sidetracked here. You've got to understand something. God is so powerful. When he gets ready to bring you out. I don't care what Exodus says. And there was another Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. Name your Pharaoh that withstands you coming out. You may be facing something your family's never faced. The past has never faced. Hell may raise up a Pharaoh that mocks you and your God. God says, I don't care what kind of Pharaoh's holding you. When I say you're coming out, I'll make Pharaoh let you go. And I don't care what I got to use to bring you out. I'll drive them crazy with lice and flies and frogs and bloody water and three days of darkness and murrain and raining hail and pestilence I'll make all of nature obey me because I'm the master and Pharaoh is trying to tell you that he's the master but he's a lion dog he ain't the master when I make bear my mighty arm he'll bow his knee and he'll even ask Moses why don't you bless me before you go All I'm trying to tell you is, when he gets ready to bring you out, he, he, he can bring you out. 
He, he brings you out. And when you come out, you're coming out with a lot of stuff. You come out with more than you had before. Just a minute, put my notes away. It's time to go home. All I'm trying to tell you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that when God gets ready to bring you out, He can bring you out so fast that He told Israel, I brought you out on eagle's wings. He didn't bring you out in a sparrow in a chicken coop. He said, I get ready to bring you out. He said, I brought you out as fast as an eagle can move. God gets you out of your hell and your chaos and your depression and your disaster, your discouragement so fast, you don't even hardly know what happened. He said, weeping may endure for the night. Joy cometh in the morning. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven. <laughs> suddenly there was an earthquake. <laughs> a lady with an issue of blood, 12 years, 12 years, 12 years. And suddenly, she's out. If I, if I can just touch the hem of the master's garment, his garment's got so much power to bring me out. Thirty-eight long years a dude sitting at the pool of Bethesda. And the master comes by. Won't be whole. I ain't got no man. I didn't ask you what you got. You won't be whole. I have no man when the water's trouble. Stop putting your faith in the water. The master's here. You won't be whole. Thirty-eight years he's been held hostage. He brought him out so fast, all he said was, Arise! Yes. Take up your bed! And walk! I've often wondered, Brother Super, why the Lord told him, Take up your bed. He said it two times. Mark 2, the cripple come through the roof. John 5, pool of Bethesda. Both times, he said, pick up your bed. And I looked at that and I said, what's the deal? I would think he would have got rid of the bed so he wouldn't have a relapse. Where, where's my coat? Give me my coat. Now, this is just me and we're going for chicken right now. Watch. Oh, God. Super, watch this. 38 years the pallet the bed has been carrying him and when the Lord says you're free now carry what used to carry you why brother Morgan why is he carrying it for one reason as a testimony he wants us to show the world what we've got the victory over because we met the master oh let's give the Lord a praise